Welcome to the Cinema Rag, where we celebrate the greatest and worst in Hollywood films and their most self-indulgent, narcissistic actors, directors, and producers. Here, we will laud and malign Hollywood's seedier elements with levity and humor. They love cinema as much as anyone does. and They've been talking about it for over 30 years. Time to get trashy. Here's Gregory and May. Hello, everybody. This is Gregory, and welcome back to another episode of the Cinema Rag. I hope you're doing well today. Today, we're going to look at Alexander Skarsgård. I, I think this guy has an interesting career, and I want to posit the question, why has this guy not had a more successful career? Now, many of you might not be familiar with him. I think if you saw a picture of him, you would know who he was. And of course, many of you know who he, who he is, and some of you don't know who he is. And then all I have to say is true blood. Eric, and then you'll know who he is because that's probably his most famous role in his breakout role. Now, Skarsgård is from Sweden. He is the eldest son of Stellan Skarsgård, who I think most people would, would call him a, that guy. If you don't know who he is, you would recognize him. I think his most famous roles would be one of the men in the Mamma Mia movies the two movies probably the one that is the least known i think he is sam the guy who owns the boat i'm a big fan of the mamma mia movies but everybody there would probably know stellan skarsgård out of a process out of elimination because you know who colin firth is and you know who uh the irish stud that is Remington steel that is pierce brosnan so he's the other guy he's the other guy you also might know him from Goodwill Hunting. That's movies I love number one over here at the Cinema Rag, and he plays the douchebag professor that takes Will Hunting slash Matt Damon under his wing. He's also been in the Da Vinci Code and a bunch of other movies. You would recognize Stellan Skarsgård, his dad. Now, going back to Alexander Skarsgård, he's got the classic Nordic looks. He's six four and very thin. And a handsome man. He's a handsome man. He did some work early on in Sweden, but he didn't really make it big until, as I mentioned, True Blood. If you're not familiar with True Blood, it was an HBO show that was really big about 15 years ago. And it starred Anna Paquin. And it's essentially about vampires and humans interacting with vampires in uh, the South, in Louisiana, if I'm not mistaken, small town Louisiana. And he plays essentially the leader of the vampires in that area. And he's the foil to Bill, the other vampire, who is the, is the, the main love interest of Anna Paquin's human character. Or I think later on you find out she's not human, she's elf, or I, I don't remember. I mean, I, I did watch the first couple seasons of that show, but it's been some time. But he is exceedingly charismatic in that in that TV show, and when when men, when women would watch that show, they'd be like, "Oh my God, this guy's hot!" And they certainly liked him more than Bill, who was the who was the lead. And so that's where he got his break was in True Blood, and then from there he has done some movies. Most of them were not that successful, I would say. He did. I am not a big Lars Van Trier fan, but he was in Melancholia. That's kind of the end of the world movie that takes place with Kirsten Dunst getting married. He was in that. He was in he was in Straw Dogs. I think Straw Dogs is actually a pretty good remake of the old Sam Peckinpah Straw Dogs. That's a movie that it's a couple that are in the woods and then they're essentially attacked by these like white trash guys and he's the leader of the white trash guys and they have to overcome them. It's a really good movie. Uh, the original is much more violent. Then he's in that horrible remake, Battleship, that's based on the... <laughs> I guess it's based on the, the board game, but... It's a Peter Berg movie, and it stars him and Taylor Kitsch. That's when Taylor Kitsch had her moment and then no longer had her his moment after that and John Carter. So then you, you see just not a lot of, of, of really big success, it just, just kind of crap. He does eventually land Tarzan. And I think Tarzan, and this is in 2016, Tarzan is, is not like the kind of Georgia the Jungle goofy Tarzan. They try to do a legitimate Tarzan, and Margot Robbie is in this movie, and he is, of course, Tarzan, and he is cut. I mean, he is cut. 
I mean, think about it. Good looking, 6'4", six, six pack abs. And this isn't the first time he he does this kind of look. And he is exceedingly handsome in this movie. The movie doesn't really do well uh, because, you know, when people think of Tarzan, they want to think of the Disney kind of Tarzan. And so to, to do a kind of serious treatment of the Edgar Rice Burroughs novel is, 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 is difficult, I think. But I think that got him attention to a certain extent. So then he doesn't really do anything aside from that that's like well known. 2019, he does Aftermath. I think Aftermath is an interesting, it's an interesting movie. Uh, this came out right before COVID, but it's got Kira Knightley as the wife of Jason Clark during World War II. And he plays, Alexander plays a not a German or a Nazi who's staying at the house of this British officer played by Jason Clark and his wife. And eventually she has an affair with the German played by Skarsgård. He's also in Longshot, which I think is, is a very poor comedy uh, that's got Seth Rogen and Charlize Theron. Charlize Theron, I think, is running for vice president. And he is kind of the goofy pot smoking political advisor. And he plays the prime minister in that. I wouldn't say it's like a large role in that, but he's in that. He's also in The Kill Team, which is a war drama that was done in 2019. Didn't do that well. Then he goes back to the action. Does Godzilla versus Kong in 2021. Again, you know, these movies make money, but I, you know, just, just nothing. Then he comes back and he does... Which I think his his scars guardian scars guardisons so to speak he does a couple of things so during this time he goes back to television and does he goes back to television and does Big Little Lies now Big Little Lies was a big show and it was on HBO 2017 or so and he plays this is the show run uh, produced by Reese Witherspoon. And it's got Nicole Kidman as well, and it's got uh, Brett Favre's ex, Shailene Woodley. And essentially, he plays the husband of Nicole Kidman's character. So he plays the the husband, and it's it's a really good role, and it kind of taps into a little to his True Blood role, Eric. But he is very subtle, but very abusive. So he essentially you find out in the series. In this in the season that he and Nicole Kidman look, they both get off on having this. I wanted to let you know about some of the other feeds here at the Eclectico Gregorio. The oldest one we have is the Awakened Man, which mostly deals with holistic health, medical cover-ups, ways to biohack your life, to ensure longer longevity, medical conspiracies, and naturopathic stuff. We also have, and that there's probably about 400, 500 episodes over there. We started that one back in 2017, 2016, I believe. We also have the Female Holistic Health Apothecary, which originally started as an essential oils feed. And there's about 100 episodes on essential oils, particular essential oils like rose and lavender and sandalwood and so forth. And then later I morphed it into more topics that are regarded for female health, female specific We've had that feed also since 2016. And then lastly, we have Confessions of an Obese Child, which deals with my childhood obesity and trauma that came from it. So it's a great feed for those who dealt with childhood trauma that led you to have addictions to alcohol or food. And I interview several people and what it was like to grow up overweight and all the difficulties of losing the weight and then keeping it off and trying to metamorphosize into a regular weighted person so check out those feeds at the eclectical gregory on apple or spotify they both get off on this kind of physical relationship where i'm not saying that she's wanting to get beat but they're both hitting each other and he plays a real good portrayal i think it's a, probably the best portrayal on television or on film of like like how a man who beats his wife in his mind rationalizes why he beats his wife. And so it's a very fascinating portrayal. But it's a, it's a good show. Season two, they brought in Meryl Streep because spoiler alert, season one, they end up, uh, he ends up dying. I'm not gonna tell you how he dies because season two is kind of the, the follow-up to that. Meryl Streep plays 
his uh, his mom who comes in to investigate wants to find out the truth about as as to why he died but he's very good in that role and he and Kidman have excellent chemistry in that role so he does that television uh portrayal and then so going back to his movies he does the northman the northman is a fascinating movie so it came out in 2022 right after godzilla versus kong which was kind of a crap movie and this is kind of the movie that I think he needs to do more of. So in The Northman, it is a history movie. It's the Vikings. And he plays this guy who essentially, uh, Ethan Hawke is his dad. He's the king or whatever the equivalent is at that time. And he is he, his, he's murdered by uh, his brother, Ethan Hawke's brother. So it's by his uncle. And he's able to escape because the uncle wants to kill, of course, him. And this is when he's very young. But he's able to escape and he essentially grows up with his vengeance wanting to kill the uncle who is now the, the king. And so Nicole Kidman, again playing in this, Nicole Kidman plays the wife of Ethan Hawke. And so she is not murdered. And then he finds out after he has grown up and he wants to go back to avenge his father's death the uncle is now the king and nicole kidman was forced to marry uh, the 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 brother the brother ethan hawk's brother and so he needs to uh Skarsgård needs to figure out like how he's gonna kind of hatch a scheme to just destroy this uncle who killed his father and also like what to do with his mom because he doesn't know if his mom voluntarily married the 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 brother or was just kind of like, you know, back then, this is like 10th century, right? He did, she didn't really have a lot of choices. So it's an interesting movie. And I think if you want like a good movie on Viking culture, Viking mythology, Viking religion, Viking anything, fascinating movie. I'm not saying it's like a great movie, but it's an interesting movie. It also has Anna Taylor-Joy. And I mean, God, can you have any more like of a Nordic coupling than Alexander Skarsgård and Anna Taylor-Joy? So they, they, I think she's a slave or something like that. Anyways, they end up getting together. And I won't ruin the ending of the movie, but it's a fascinating movie. It's probably most famous for him and the uncle, played by Clang Bays, uh, having a sword fight naked at the end of the movie. It's a fascinating movie, and I think it, it reminds you how he has talent. And this is what the whole crux of this episode's about, because... You look at Northmen, and I definitely recommend you watch the movie. It is violent, but it, it's definitely a recommended. And then he did a, a recent spell on HBO Succession. So clearly HBO likes him quite a bit. And he plays essentially the the the, the guy who's going to end up buying the, the family business of the, the Roys. So I've done an episode here on Succession when its last season started. Uh, back in, I guess it would have been March, and he plays a, a prominent role, and he's excellent in this season of Succession. And so I, I look at Skarsgård because he is 46 now, and I just kind of ponder as to like, what's up with this guy? What's up with this guy? Is it go? Does it go back to one of two things? He has no talent, or Hollywood doesn't know how to use him, and or he's just one of those demons who is very picky about his roles, or he's hard to work with. So I think with Skarsgård, it's a combination of things. I think he's a pretty cerebral guy. If you've heard him be interviewed, he, he is pretty articulate and cerebral. And I don't think it's a question of lack of talent. I think Hollywood recognizes that he is... And we, we did an episode not that long ago on the differences between the chameleon actors and the standard movie star actors. So you have like the Tom Hanks, the Paul Rudds, the Ryan Gosling, these guys who essentially always play the set themselves in every movie. Then you have the chame the chameleon types like the Fastbenders and the Daniel Day Lewis. And there's a certain archetype in both. And with Skarsgård, Skarsgård definitely has the outward sign of being a leading man. He's six four. He's in shape. He has that very strong Nordic look. And then you look at his filmography, and yeah, it took us some time to get started. He was doing a lot of, of films in Sweden. Of course, clearly Sweden, you're not going to get a lot of notice from Hollywood as much. So he didn't do 
or really get big until Generation Kill on HBO and then really on, on True Blood, which was 2008. And if you look, he's 46, so it was around 30 years old or so before he got big. And it's interesting that I think his choices, especially like Battleship and, and Godzilla versus Kong and Tarzan, I just think that Hollywood doesn't know how to use him. Because when he's in the right role, he can come off charismatic, sexy, yet cerebral. And in even something like on Succession, where he underplays his hunkiness and he's kind of this like IT geek who has no social skills, you can still tell he's a very nuanced, good actor. And so I think given his age, he's 46, and unfortunately 46 for men is different than 46 for women. I hate to tell you women, but it is different. You know, it's what different. I think he has a good career ahead of him. I just think that either he needs to re reevaluate his agent, maybe, and his team, because they're not picking the right roles for him. And I think he needs to just... I think the older it gets, he's going to stay away from the action movies. I think he just needs to do more dramas. I think he excels in dramas when it's the right dramatic role. Do character parts. Kind of like be like a fast bender. And that fast bender is, is mostly gravitated toward like serious films. And I think like fast bender, they're both tall and handsome. And look, they could do an awesome movie where they're brothers, for example. But... I think Skarsgård is talented. I think Hollywood doesn't know how to use him. And I think sometimes maybe he's just his own worst enemy. But I think he does have a promising future. And he just might be like a Harrison Ford type. Where Harrison Ford was what, a carpenter when, before he was discovered for American Graffiti and then even Star Wars. He was older uh, when he got all those big breaks. He was in his mid-30s. And look at that career he had. I'm not saying that Skarsgård is necessarily going to have a Harrison Ford career. What I'm saying is that he is talented, and I just think that Hollywood hasn't used him right. And I think they will recalibrate, or he will recalibrate, or something will happen where I think they will use him more often. And look, maybe he's just the type of guy who doesn't want to be doing two, three projects a year. Maybe he just wants to work here and there. Maybe he's got that European mindset of, you know, I want to enjoy my life. And I don't need to be working all the time. But if, if that's the case, that is perfectly fine. If Fassbender's done that, just choose better roles and be a little more picky. In his personal life, he just recently had his first child. He's 46 or so, and he had his first child. And uh, there's not really much on his dating life. Uh, but uh, he had a child with a Swedish woman. Guys, post in the Cinema Rag poll what you think of Alexander. If you think he's uh, overrated, underrated, or just right, I'll post a poll over there. There's two links in the episode notes. One is a PayPal link to make a donation. The other one is a link to the website. So you can check all the Eclipsco Gregorio feeds, but you can just find them on Apple and Spotify. And while you're on Apple and Spotify, please rate and review because it helps with the algorithm. Until next time, take care, God bless, and pray. Thanks for listening to the Cinema Rag. Please post an honest review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Check out the episode notes to visit our website and to make a donation. Lastly, follow the rag today. Until next time.